Heavenly Father, we thank you for the conclusion and the climax of this convention. Thank you, Lord, for everything you've spoken since we started. We're asking, oh Lord, that you speak your word to every heart once again, now in Jesus' name. Amen. And we pray that you give us listening ears and obedient hearts, that Lord, on the final day, we'll be grateful to you that you gave us such a heart and such a mind to listen to your word and to be obedient to your word in Jesus' name. Amen. We're asking, oh Lord, that your word will bring light to everyone. And the light to shed on a pathway will live and walk according to this word in Jesus' name. Amen. Help us, Lord, to be single-minded, to be serious-minded and spiritual, so that, Lord, your word will fall on fatal ground in every heart in Jesus' Amen. name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And everybody said. Amen. We thank God for the conclusion of the Congress or the conference that we came for at this time. And it's a fitting that we're ending up with the message, living and ministering with eternity in view. Very difficult to understand eternity. It's a time without end. It's a period and age without an end. If you could think about the river by us, by our side over here. If a boy were to take just a cup and then go there and empty just a cup and then throw it away for just one, once a year. Once, if he finishes that, goes again the following year and takes a cup out of that river. When that child, when that boy or girl has emptied the whole river, that means just one day of eternity has passed. You think about that. That eternity is time without end. It's on and on and on. Think of a hundred years. Think of a thousand years. And think of a million years, and think of a trillion years, and eternity has just begun. And then for you to live either on the right side or on the left hand side for all eternity time without end is something we need to think about. That's why we're looking at this, living with eternity in view. As somebody said that if you have a three doors in the house, and the, there's a first door while you're coming in, and then there's another door, and then the final door that gets you to your room. Why don't you write these words on the front door outside? Everything that causes pain is for a moment. Whatever pain it is, whatever sickness it is, whatever poverty it is, and whatever predicament it might be, everything that causes pain is just for a moment and pin that on the, on the first door. And then on the second door, as you move in, you see, everything that causes pleasure, everything that helps you make you happy and joyful in this life, everything that causes pleasure just for a moment. And then on the final door that leads to your bedroom, which is the final thing you see that night. And then when you are coming out in the morning, that's the first thing you are going to see because you are coming out of your room and you say, the only thing that matters is what is eternal. The only thing that matters is what is eternal. From the front door, everything that causes pain just for a moment. And then the second door, everything that causes pleasure just for a, just for a moment. But the thing that really matters, the essential thing, the non-negotiable, is a thing that lasts for all eternity. So that every day as you are coming from the outside world, the pleasure, the pain that you went through, then you saw that that is just for a moment. And then before you sleep, you read that thing, the only thing that matters. And the only thing that you need to think about, the non-negotiable, the essential thing, is what is eternal. And then when you are coming out in the morning, that's the very first thing to see, you see. So that all through the day you are thinking about this. All these things don't matter, you know. The pleasure and the pain and the property and everything. And the only thing that matters during that day will be things that will be eternal. Uh, from that angle, from that perspective, you're looking at the verses of Scripture we're looking at together. In Matthew chapter 7, I read from verse 13. Matthew chapter 7, verse 13, enter ye in at the straight gate. That means at the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth unto destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. It says there are two ways. One is narrow. One is straight. And you're going to actually be squeezed in before you can get in and you can walk on that road. And the other one is very broad. It's the way of liberty. 
I hope that all the things we have been hearing during this uh, convention, you are not interpreting anything anybody is saying, anything I'm saying, anything any other person is saying, as if the way now is very broad. We can live the way we like. Because Jesus said that broad is the way, and broad is the gate that leads unto destruction. And as you listen to your popular preachers, uh, you know, over here, we, we don't want to mention any name, but sometimes maybe we should, but I will not this time. But you, we, it's very difficult to recommend anybody in the United States here. You know, they were asking the other fellow the other time uh, over here in the U.S., and he said, now tell us very clearly, are you saying that the Muslims and the homosexuals will not get to heaven, he backed out. He said, how could I say that? He said, Jesus said, all the sheep I have, which are not of this fold, and them I must bring in. But if you read the whole verse, it says, and they will hear me, and they'll believe me, they'll follow me. It's not talking about bringing, you know, the Muslims and all the homosexuals, everybody in, whether they believe in Christ or not. But that's what they're telling us. And yesterday, one of us, uh, one of our preachers mentioned somebody who had, you know, is a big, a big preacher, worldwide, international preacher. And uh, this uh, preacher said, I don't understand everything in the Bible, but I just pray, I just say, God, help me to just preach your word. That was in the 40s. That was more than 40, 60 years ago. Today, if you listen to that man and you ask him, do you believe that only those who believe in Jesus will get to heaven? He says, I cannot say that. That's what he says today, that man that was mentioned. He says today, he has seen Muslims, he has seen other people in other religions. They've never had the name of Jesus. And he cannot tell you they will not get to heaven. They make it so broad today and that it appears that people are forsaking the Bible. That's the reason why we cannot recommend anybody. Would you uh, let that, that person come back if you're a part of the church here? Where are you going? As we think about eternity, and then we're talking about this preacher and this preacher, we can't recommend anybody to you. The only person you can recommend is the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. Because he is the way, is the truth, and the life, and is the one that leads us to life eternal. Is the one that changes not. All the preachers are changing, even preachers of our own stock here. We're changing, but the word of God remains the same. And it's not how we present it. It is the word. And Jesus Christ said, enter ye in at the straight gate, at the narrow gate. Only the people that do that are going to get there on the final day. Here we're not making, is this not religion? We're not looking for a large church. We're not looking for, if you want to get this and get this, then you must make the door very wide. What if we get all those people in and those of us who were even in before they came, we lost everything. It's better to keep yourself small and keep what you have. And at least the few people there, they get to heaven. And Jesus said, only few, find the way. And thank God I'm part of that view. And I don't want to, I'm not going to exchange what I have for anything. For, you know, I see, you know, that one over there, that one over there. And some of these people that are taking over ministries. You know, you, there's a son that took over a ministry. And you know them in that part, in the, the other part, maybe where you're coming from. And now he said, you know, what his father did not do. His father was, you know, sober and all that. But now everything is marketing. And you have 25,000 people in the congregation. And people just come, they come from here, they come from there. And what the father laid down. Everything now is being changed. And then we think this is Christianity. We, we need to understand that eternity is at stake. That's the reason why you are here today and I'm going to talk to you from my heart. After all, if uh, this is the last message I preach and you get it, I think that's uh, wonderful. You know, some people, they modify what they say and they try to say it very nice so that you'll have them back another time. Why do I have to come back another time? I have a lot of places where people are asking me to come. If I'm going to go to any place, in fact, I'll tell you, there are invitations I reject in England right now by the grace of God. 
I go to, you know, these churches, not just Nigerians or the Africans. And a particular one called me. I said, please, uh, let me know about this, this, this. And when he couldn't answer the question, I said, count me out. I'm not going to waste the rest of my life just going here and there. Another one, I said, I, I would not be able to come. And then he said, please still come. I said, if I come, this is where I stand. And whether they are white or black or whatever, I want to be able to spend my life preaching the gospel that leads people to heaven. And if we do that outside, we should be able to do that in deeper life here. Amen. And because otherwise, why are we gathering together? All the gimmicks and all the things we say, all the methods, methodology will not lead anybody to heaven. It is the word of God that is going to lead us to heaven. That's why it says in verse 14 here, it says, because straight is the gate. And narrow, and narrow is the way that leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. That's Jesus Christ. That's the Lord, our Savior. He wants everybody saved. He died for the whole world. But then he said, he said, few will find it. I just pray you'll be part of that few. Yeah. Look at verse 15. It says, beware of false prophets. That's what the Bible says. Beware of false prophets. You know that Jesus Christ even mentioned them. He mentioned the Pharisees. He mentioned the Sadducees. He mentioned the Herodias. He said, look at this and look at this. He mentioned them by name. And Paul, the apostle, even mentioned them by name. Why are we so, you know, we were so taken in by what is around us here that we cannot warn our people and that we are not talking to our people that this is the way, what key they are in. And then it says in verse 16, it says, you shall know them by their fruits. You shall know them by their fruits. It's not the marketing strategy. It's the Holy Ghost that gives us growth. Amen. I said it's the Holy Ghost that gives us growth. Amen. Look at Acts of the Apostles chapter 2 and look at Peter, look at John, look at all those apostles. Where are the, you know, gimmicks and where are the marketing something that you find there? All that we find over here, the churches that are growing, apart from the few evangelicals who are faithful to the scriptures, it's all marketing. It's all the gimmicks that people learn. We can skip the Holy Ghost out and yet still have growth because of the things and the way things are done. When you are, you are society friendly, you are youth friendly, you are, you know, everybody friendly, but you are not Bible friendly. Uh, that, that's, that's very dangerous. We're not going to do that here. Yeah. We're going to stick to this word that gets people to heaven. We don't want to turn this deeper life Bible church into another denomination, another religious uh, group, another religious entity that people just come and then they dictate to us, do it this way and do it that way and whatever the people want. And we, you know, we, we just keep it like that. And we're saying we cannot copy. Why, don't, why can't you? Like father, like children. Isn't, isn't it the same gospel? Is there a different way of salvation in America than the one in Nigeria? Is there a different way? Re the same repentance and the same restitution and the same faith in the Lord, that's what takes people to heaven. We're not talking about uh, whether you are starting at 9 o'clock or we start at 8 o'clock. That's a different thing. We're not talking about whether you're having three days, uh, you know, retreat or you're having four days convention. That's a different thing. We're talking about the teaching of the word of God. And it's the same. You don't want anybody to cajole you and think that, you know, whatever you hear, you know, you know Lagos is there. Lagos is Lagos. Lagos is your headquarters. And you have a generous friend in Lagos that directs you and tells you that this is the way. How did you get saved? How are other people going to get saved? What kind of salvation do you have? Is it not this same biblical salvation that led us into a new life? Whosoever, if any man be in Christ, is what? A new, a new creature. What's a new creature? Somebody different from what he was before. What are we doing? We are saying that, uh, you know, it, uh, we don't uh, copy Bagada. What's Bagada? What do you have in Bagada? It's not the name of the place. It's what came out of that place. And look at me here. I'm the product of Bagada. I came out of there. And I won't tell you that. Don't, don't, I won't tell you don't copy me. Why, why won't you copy me? If I am wrong, then I'm not sure of where I'm going. If I'm wrong, I'm not sure that you are. Then I will say, well, you are, I'm coming from Bagada. Don't uh, follow what I do. I don't follow what I say. I can't say that. And no preacher here that God has used the general superintendent to raise up will come and tell you in the presence of that general superintendent, don't follow him. Don't follow Bagada. Don't follow Lagos. Don't follow Nigeria. Don't follow the teaching, the doctrine you have been given. All that will be error. And I will not be responsible for the loss of anyone and if you, go, if you go astray, I've told you, 
I've told you the word of God. Now, we're talking about Wesley. We're talking about Whitfield. You, you've not tried Wesley. Yes, Wesley will keep, will try to be friendly. But then, when he came to what he believed, he really stood for it. Even Spurgeon, on the Calvinistic side, was very, very firm. And you will not find a Spurgeon. Spurgeon never will mention the people in the, on the Armenian side. And Wesley never will mention the people at the Calvinistic side because they knew what they believed. We don't come in here and then just put everything in the same bag and say, you know, this and this. Be very careful. We're here. We know what we stand for. And because we know what we stand for, that's why we're here. If I didn't know what I stood for, I wouldn't be taking the stand I'm taking. And you need to understand where I'm coming from. And I've suffered for this gospel. And I'm still willing to suffer for this gospel. If you believe the gospel the way we're giving it to you, then you are part of deeper life. If you don't believe it, why don't you just check out? Other people have checked out too. And they started their own. And they're doing that, and they're responsible for themselves. But while you are here, you are responsible to God, you are responsible to me. Amen. And that means then that whatever you do, you cannot tell people, report me to the GS. So what can he do? Of course, I can do something. I can do it because I'm still the leader in this church, both in America and Africa and everywhere. And what I stand for is the word of God. I don't want anybody twisting my hand or twisting my neck or trying to test me, to test the waters whether it will respond or not. We will take to the word of God in this place. Amen. And when it comes to the point of saying, if we go too far and I see that we are going to mislead people, I'll have to, you know, take a stand. I know, I know your laws here. Don't think I don't know the laws here. I know the laws. But then the laws also will recognize that, you know, there's organization in any church. I will keep to that organization. So I'm appealing to our overseers and our leaders because I would have told you privately, but because you said it publicly, I don't want the church to go away with the idea that whatever you preach and whatever you say, everything is all right. Everything is not all right. Only sound doctrine is all right. I said only sound doctrine is all right. That's why it says in verse 18, in verse 17, it says, Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every, it says every tree that bringeth forth not good fruit will be cut down, hewn down, and cast into where? into the fire. And then it says, wherefore, by their fruits, ye shall know them. By their fruits, ye shall know them. Is the fruit of salvation. That's how we know the people. The fruit of obedience. That's how we know the people who are born again. That's how we know the people that the gospel has impact in our lives. If the gospel does not have impact in our lives, it's because of the people who are preaching to us and because of the things we are receiving from them. Because we just want to make up church. We don't want to make up church here. We want to teach the word of God that leads people to life eternal. The only thing we're interested in is the transformation of life, the change of life. And I pray that that will take place in our lives in Jesus' name. Look at verse 21. Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. That's what you find out. What's the will of the Father? Repentance. What's the will of the Father? Righteousness. What's the will of the Father? Living a pure life, a transparent life, a holy life. What's the will of the Father? Following everything that Christ has ordained. That's the will of the Father. And it says, it's not everyone that calls me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of God. It's the people that do the will of the Father that will get into heaven. Then it says, many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And you know, many people, I, I hope you, well, maybe you are not listening to the people here. Or if you are listening, you are not evaluating what they're doing with the word of God. And there's, uh, you know, a popular prophetess in your land over here that just, you know, uh, the apostle first started with, uh, you know, he, she rebuked the husband publicly. And, you know, they carried that openly. And then later now they said that, you know, she's uh, trying to divorce uh, her husband and she's still prophetess. They prophesy. 
And then the people that work all these uh, miracles, uh, are, are you not listening to your news? The people that are arranged, you know, behind. Uh, what's your name? What's the name of your doctor? And all that is written down. And then he comes to the congregation. And then he comes to you and he says, have I met you before? Your name, hold on, hold on. Is your name such and such? Yes. Word of knowledge. Is the name of your doctor, Dr. Sam? Yes. And then people clap. All those people clapping, they don't understand the arrangement that was made behind the scene. And then it says, in the name of Jesus, get up. And then you find the person you're trying to, and then he gets up all of his, and it's a miracle, miracle. What kind of miracle? It's prearranged. And sometimes the government catches some of them. They have a work in Haiti, they have work here, they have work here, and they get all the money, and eventually, when they run after them, they see that all the money they say is going to Haiti is not going to Haiti. And sometimes, sometimes they are jailed. Why are we just following people without understanding? I'm not living here, yet I know all that. And so we need to be careful that the word of God we have is enough for us. Amen. That's why we're not emphasizing, you know, I could tell you testimonies. Of miracles. I could tell you things that happen. Even this year, the things that happen that are kind of supernatural, but I'm not into that. All I'm after is by the grace of God, if you listen to me and you give me a chance to tell you everything I know, I know that you'll get to heaven. Amen. That's the important thing. We're not looking for, you know, all these things that will, you know, tickle people, make people happy or make people whatever. We can get that outside. But when you come inside here, by the grace of God, we want to talk about the kind of life that takes us to heaven. That's why we're looking at this today, that you are living and ministering with eternity in view. You know what they do in all the other countries of the world? Anywhere you call deeper life, anywhere you say deeper life, whether it's Germany or it's in UK or anywhere, our Bible study comes from the headquarters, comes from Lagos. And whatever we're preaching there, that Monday is the leadership that decided that. That they said that our Monday Bible study will go to all our church locations all over the world. But you know, it's over here that, you know, some of us, uh, pastors and leaders, we have the liberty. No, we don't want that Lagos kind of Bible study. We want to, you know, I want to teach it directly myself. Well, I appreciate your teaching directly yourself, but you have, you know, your revival out there, you have your Sunday there. You can, you know, you can show that you are part of the church by giving us this privilege that the Bible study as they're doing all over the world comes to you. Instead of, you know, this one is doing it, that one is not doing it, where's the uniformity? And where is the togetherness? And where is the understanding that we know that this man, God used him to raise up this church, and if God wants you to be here, you are here because you accept what we're saying. You know, some people say it's dull, some people say it's not lively. That's how I said it, and now we have about, you know, about a million people or more that got saved, that are fellowshipping with the church, as we present it like this, whether we go through the gimmicks uh, that people go through or not, that's what we're doing, and, you know, God is honoring the word. If God is honoring the word in many countries, I think he'll honor the word over here, too. Yeah. And, you know, our, my English is not that bad, <laughs> you know. It's not, you know, they say, you know, it's, uh, I think uh, the intonation is colorful. <laughs> I said the intonation is colorful. Yeah. Everybody, doesn't, everybody doesn't speak like American. You know, British people speak their own English. Uh, Bonke speaks in his own English, and it's not American English. And people listen to him in America here. Young Gicho speaks in some kind of English, and people listen to him in America here. And Obiab Kumuyu speaks in some English too. Yeah. And we should listen. Rather than thinking that, you know, if, uh, you know, the pastor wants us to listen over here, then he has to copy the people. Young Gicho just speaks like, you know, like a Korean. And uh, Bonke speaks his English like a German. And William speaks English like, like a Nigerian. Yeah. And I go to, you know, all these international conferences. If I show you the testimonials, what other people have written, British uh, preachers, what they have written about me. When they finish listening to me, one of them said, I've listened to many preachers all over the world, and this is one of the top ten I've ever listened to, and he published it in the U.K., and so what are we talking here? That, you know, people, we cannot put a, the message we have over radio, over television, because this and that, I think we should get out of this kind of wrestling. 
because I know it's not how we say it. It is the spirit behind the word that creates the power. And I pray that God will help every one of us to be humble enough to repent and push all that aside. And we're going to move up so far together in Jesus' name. We want to live and minister with eternity in view. Number one fundamental foundational experiences for all men there's something foundational we cannot change there's something foundational we cannot tamper with and we're talking about foundational experiences for all men foundation is very important i'm looking at psalm 11 and we're looking at verse 3 psalm 11 and we're looking at verse 3 it says in verse 3 if the foundations be destroyed what can the righteous do if the foundations be destroyed, any local church where you are, any assembly where you are, if the foundation is taken away, and then by, you know, the method of speaking, by ability to communicate, uh, we communicate in such a way that the people lose the foundation of whatever we're doing, that, you know, the preachers cannot have the confidence anymore, the boldness anymore, or to the, you know, the, the ability to declare that this is the foundation of the world. If the foundation be destroyed, what will the righteous do? And uh, that's why it's important that we keep to that foundation, the foundation of repentance, the foundation of um, salvation. If you look at Hebrews chapter 6, reading there from verse 1, Hebrews chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 1. you see what a foundation is all about there. Repentance is part of that salvation. Hebrews chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 1. Yeah, it tells us in Hebrews 6, verse 1, it says, Therefore, leaving the first principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works. Repentance is a foundational doctrine, a foundational experience. And the Lord is saying, if we're going to do anything at all, we must keep to that foundation. When a sinner comes from outside, the sinner is supposed to understand that sin brings judgment. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. And if we don't want to die, that's why Jesus came. He was lifted up on the cross so that he, he died for everyone. And then you come, you lay all that sin at the foot of Calvary. And then you tell him, you, you plead with him to forgive you. And then that salvation comes as we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And that salvation is foundational. There's nothing before salvation. You know, somebody is coming to the church will say, we cannot tell you about salvation now, about repentance now, about change of life now. Yeah, it's just coming. We want to lay foundation for us. What other foundation before salvation? What other foundation before repentance? It tells us in Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2, I'm reading there from verse 1. Hebrews chapter 2, we're reading from verse 1. This is foundational, the experience of salvation. It says, therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them sleep. We should give them more earnest heed. As you, you know, many of us who were born again when you were still at home, when you, when you were either in Nigeria or Ghana or Sierra Leone or any other part of Africa, and then you came over here. Now, what you got before you came here is still good enough. Salvation is always salvation. And just transferring from one place to the other place does not change the very fact that you got saved and that you live the life, and you knew the standard of the word of God. If God said yes at that time, this is how to live, and now you come to a new land, does that mean that God is now saying, what I told you when you were in your country, that is no more right. That's no more correct. I'm now, I mean, God that changes from nation to nation. I mean, God that changes from one place to the other. Of course, no. What it means is that you've got the foundational expense of salvation. You repented of your sin. You believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you are now here. Look at me. I'm, I travel all over everywhere. I go to places in Europe and Africa and Asia and everywhere. That doesn't change me. And when I go there to preach, I preach what I know. And the, I thank God that they're giving testimony that their lives are changing. If I just went with the people over there and I said what they wanted me to say, nobody will change. It will just be that I went to add to the error that they were perpetrating. But by the grace of God, I go there. The only thing they can do is they will say, don't come again. And I say, thank God. I've spoken what I need to speak. And if I don't come again, that's all right. But they're still saying, come and come and come again. 
And if they say, come and come again, even when they realize that what this man is saying, their pastors were not saying the thing, and their pastors also are telling them, they are saying that, well, this is what we used to tell you about now. You know, I, when I, this last time I was in Ukraine, you know, I was, uh, you know, preaching to them and all, and they asked questions. And, you know, questions are tricky. And when they asked those questions, I gave them what I knew as the word of God. And then the pastor rose up and the pastor said, you know what? I got saved through this man in Nigeria. And I was sent, I came over here to USSR. And without this man, I will not be a Christian. And without me, you will not be in the church. So by logic, without A, B will not come. Without B, C will not come. So without A, C will not be there. You understand? Yeah. So he said, without this man, you will not be there. Therefore, whatsoever he says, he says, that's the truth. And the man is not deep alive. And he only was in deep alive for six months, more than 20 years ago. And he could still tell his people like that and handed over the leadership and everything to me and said, just teach them everything we ought to know. Now, if those who are not in deeper life would do that, I about those of us who are here. I went to a Baptist church in uh, London, and then when I finished uh, preaching uh, that Sunday, the leadership went to me there. They said, please don't go. They said, we don't want to be inviting you to just give messages that you are, too, you, are too more for, you are more than that. They gave me their constitution. They gave me their vision and their mission statement. They said, look through and then help us in the leadership. Let us know what to do. Now, if even Baptists, if they are saying that, I about Pentecostal people, I about deeper life people themselves, I think we have taken too much into our hands. We need to shape up and we need to correct our ways. And in any branch church, if we're not following the way we are teaching, we just know that that pastor wants to, you know, go to another church or do any other thing. And I think a way others will know what to do. I said where others will know what to do. If I, go, if I go to a restaurant and then you give me something that gives me runny stomach, and the hairs, um, you are watching your hairs, you are watching your weight, you are watching all these things that I tell you about, cholesterol and everything. If you go to a restaurant and they give you something that is going to destroy your health, and then you keep on going, and you are an adult. And there are not other restaurants you can go and eat. I told you that before. So why is it that somebody will just, you know, be there and is not willing to, you know, it's better or it's, uh, it's easier for one person, a pastor, to repent and to say, I'm sorry. I know that this is not right. Than to expect everybody that got something before to change and then water down everything that we have got and then for the whole deeper life to change because of one person. I think that will not be right. I said it will not be right. And so we should be able to take our stand and say, here is where we stand. If it's deeper life, let it be deeper life. Yeah. And it will be deeper life. Yeah. And we don't change anything because of our children. We're going to change the whole of the church because of the youth, because of your own children. We're not going to change anything. Yeah. If our children want to get to heaven, there's no, there's no new way. There's no other way for children to get to heaven. The same way their parents are going to get to heaven, that's the same way those children are going to get to heaven. Without salvation, none of our children will get there. Uh, but with salvation, praise the Lord, both daddy and mommy and children can get to heaven in the same way, with repentance and with salvation. And then living the life that gets us rapturable, righteous in the sight of the Lord. I believe that will happen in Jesus' name. Amen. It says over here in chapter two of uh, chapter two of Hebrews, chapter two. I'm reading there from verse one. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest we let them sleep at any time. Then it says, for if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression it says, and every and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape? How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? How shall we escape the judgment of God? How shall we escape the perdition that will come on the final day if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? That's foundational, and we're not going to change that foundation in Jesus' name. Yeah. Now, when it says, when I say foundation, look at Matthew chapter, Matthew chapter 18. In Matthew chapter 18, I'm reading from verse 3 and from verse 4. Matthew chapter 18, 
We're reading from verse 3 and reading from verse 4. In Matthew 18, verses 3 and 4, if you are opening your Bible, it says, And said, Verily I say unto you, Except ye be converted. That word, except, that's foundational. Except ye be converted. Don't just play church. Except there's real conversion, real transformation, real change of life. That you are not the person you used to be. You are not walking the way you used to walk. All the morality is gone. All the idol worship is gone. All the love of money, covetousness is gone. There is a change of life. And it says, except ye be converted, ye shall in no wise, look at it in that, uh, in that verse, in that verse 3, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, that means then that conversion is basic. Conversion is foundational. Conversion is very important, very essential, and except that takes place. Now, if we ministers are not preaching conversion, if we're preaching other things, telling stories, interesting stories, wonderful stories, exciting stories, and people are interested, they like to come again and hear us, but there's no conversion. It's a waste of time. It's a waste of life. And that is not how to do ministry. Except ye be converted. We must emphasize conversion. We must emphasize that change. Whether it's in the children's section or youth section or the adult section, or whether it's among, uh, you know, the Caucasians, the white people, or the black people, conversion is the real thing. If, we're minister, if it's church, if we want to get people to uh, get to heaven, that is what God is saying. Look at verse 3. It says, Whosoever therefore shall humble himself, as this little child the same, is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, in the kingdom of God too. And let's look at um, John chapter 3. John chapter 3, I'm reading verses 3 and 4. What's verse 5? John chapter 3. John chapter 3. I read from verse 3. John chapter 3, verse 3, Jesus answered and said unto him, But he verily I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That's foundational. Except a man be born again, he cannot see, he will not see the kingdom of God. That means then we preach conversion. We preach the new birth. That a person that comes to know the Lord, that comes to the church, we don't want them just to be coming, just to be coming. That we're not ready yet. Just wait. We'll tell them when the time comes. What if they die before that time comes? We we'll want to tell them at the beginning. That conversion and the new birth, being born again, is very essential. It's a non-negotiable. We're not preaching all the other things to just get them interested in the church. We don't want them to be interested in the church. We want them to be interested in Christ and to know what Christ has done for them on the cross of Calvary. And to understand that except a man, except a woman, except a boy or a girl, except anyone be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Jesus repeated that in verse five, Jesus answered, verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And when we're born again, there's something that happens. Look at first John. In first John, it tells us when we're born again, what actually happens. And we know that this is the evidence of being born again. And the evidence is still the same every time, everywhere. First John, I'm reading from chapter three, verse nine. First John chapter 3, verse 9, whosoever is born of God does not commit sin, does not continue sinning, does not rejoice in sinning, and does not accommodate, tolerate sinning. And if we're pastors and we're born again, we're not going to tolerate sin in our lives or in the lives of members of the church. And if you are born again, you'll not be rejoicing in sinning. If you fell into sin accidentally, you run back to God. It pains you. You feel ashamed. I shouldn't have done that. And then you go back to God immediately so that you can be cleansed and forgiven. But you know, to be sinning and then to say, I'm still a member of the church and no matter what happens, I'm always there. No, you are not always there. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. And then he goes on to say, for his seed remaineth in him and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Look at chapter 5. When Jesus said, except a man be born, Born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Born of water and born of the spirit, he cannot see the kingdom of God. In John chapter 5, reading from verse 18, we know 
that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. We know whosoever is born of God, he does not continue to rejoice in sinning. Does not continue to habitually in sin. And just overlook all that is not is just church, 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 church. You know, we come to church. All we're interested in is, you know, to control this and control that and control that. And we're not controlling our lives. And we're not checking our lives and resisting temptation. And we're forgotten the essential thing of getting to the kingdom of God. It says, whosoever is born of God, it says, this is what we know. That he sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself. And that wicked one toucheth him not. I pray that that will be an experience in Jesus' name. Amen. Now I'm going to, uh, I'm looking at the next point, which is fundamental essentials for all members. If you're a member of the body of Christ, a member of the church, these are fundamental essentials. That means it's non negotiable. It's not something that you say, well, if I like, I take it. If I don't like, I don't take it. If you're a member of the body of Christ, a member of the church of the living God, here is the word of God. And this is essential. It tells us in uh, Hebrews uh, chapter, chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. I read here from verse 6. You see the language of this verse. If you're a real child of God and you love God and it's not just that you're playing religion. In Hebrews uh, chapter 11, we're reading verse 6. It says, but without faith, it's impossible to please him. That's enough. Without faith. It's impossible to please him. It's not just that, you know, I'm coming to church so that a pastor will pray for me. Your personal faith. And without this personal faith, it says it is impossible for you to please the Lord. What if you just, you know, came to church all your life and then you don't have this personal faith in God and we ask about God and say some, you know, some silly things about God. And then people are laughing, and then somebody will say, well, it's just a, you know, a new person here. And you know, somebody blasphemes God, we're laughing, or somebody insults God, and we're laughing. Or somebody says something that is you know, not proper about God, and then we're laughing. What, what kind of laughter is that? Or somebody says something ridiculous about God, and then some people are clapping their hands, and I'm saying, what are we doing? Why are we clapping our hands? When it says, without faith, we cannot please God. And then it says, for whosoever comes to him, he must believe that he is, and that he is the reward of them that they get to seek him. I want you to notice that word without, without faith, without faith, without faith. It is impossible, impossible to please God. Look at chapter 12 and verse 14. You see that same word, without, which means this is an essential thing, an important thing, an indispensable thing, that without this, whatever else you have is nothing in the sight of the Lord. Hebrews chapter 12, I'm reading from verse 14. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14, it says, follow peace with all men. Follow peace with all men. I hope you understand that doesn't mean follow peace for false prophets. Jesus did not follow peace with, you know, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He didn't follow peace with Caiaphas to say, well, uh, Caiaphas really doesn't understand this. So I mean, it's good to follow peace with all men. We're not talking about following peace with the adversary of the gospel. We're not following peace with the people that reject the gospel or the people that oppose the gospel. You follow peace in normal relationship. When it comes to preaching the gospel, we have to preach the gospel straight and simple so that the people will hear a sound of the trumpet that is very clear and they know what to do and they know where to go. And I pray that God will give us wisdom in Jesus' name. So it says, follow peace with all men. And then it says, and holiness. And holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. And this is not peculiar to us. Maybe some of us are not reading the people of the past. You know, I was uh, just uh, uh, listening to J.C. Ryle last, uh, you know, yesterday and this morning. And J.C. Ryle uh, preached about uh, 150, 200 years ago. He was an Anglican. But he emphasized, he said, without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. It's not just, even Spurgeon, the Calvinistic uh, preacher, he still, you know, he preached on this, without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. If you listen to the people that are what they are sought, the people that actually know that this is way to heaven, everybody knows this. If you say you are born again, the holiness of life, of character, the holiness that is transparent, the people, in fact, they say, even those who are uh, Calvinists, they would say that 
if you don't me you don't measure to this, it means your salvation was not genuine. It means you are not really saved. Because they understand that when you are saved, there is a change in our lives. And hear the word of God. Whatever they say or whatever they don't say, this word is still real. You follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. So if we are gathering people together, minister in view of eternity and live in view of eternity that you understand that the reason we emphasize the holiness is not because you know if you if you don't do it you know it hurts me it doesn't hurt me it's like you know you are telling your child to eat if the child doesn't eat it doesn't hurt you it hurts him and if we don't live holy life transparent life in the public in the private it doesn't hurt the preacher it hurts the person that is not living the holy life and when the time comes to get to heaven he misses heaven that's why the word of God in John uh, uh, kind of commands every one of us will follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. It tells us in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 20. We're talking about things that are essential, things that are important, things that are indispensable, that this must be there. We're looking at Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. And we're reading from verse 20. Matthew chapter 5 verse 20. Here is what it says. Matthew 5, verse 20. It says, For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, ye shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven. It says, Except your righteousness will go beyond the external righteousness. And just the external, external righteousness of you know, address well, address this way, address that way. It says, Go beyond that. We're talking about heart holiness. We're talking about the purity of heart. A change of life that comes from within, and then it shows. It reflects on the outside. And Jesus said, except you have that righteousness that goes beyond the righteousness of scouts and Pharisees, you will in no wise enter into that place. I pray that the Lord will help us to have the righteousness within and without, at home and in church and everywhere in Jesus' name. Because it's only then. Only then we'll be sure that we're going to get to that place. You know, sometimes uh, maybe you are a leader and you, you, are so, you are so permissive and tolerant that when people are even living in sin and then they report you, they tell you that this is happening, they say, well, leave them. We understand. But they are, you know, they are, they are preaching to us. How can we be listening to them when we know that they're not living right? Oh, because you don't have the uh, stamina or the backbone to be able to check that person and to say, you cannot do this. This is the way work he in it. Then you're just, it's the members you'll talk to you say, well, don't worry about that. You know, everything will straighten out. We're all growing. We're still not where we ought to be yet. How about you? Are you where you ought to be? And then we, you know, talk to their brain. But it's not by the spirit. It's just all this uh, method that we use. And people are no more able to check their lives and to know that these are the way to live. I pray that things will change in Jesus' name. Amen. When we understand that this is what Christ required for membership in his church, and then by the grace of God, if God puts you in the area of leadership, you're able to manifest that and you're able to stand on the word of God that changes not. It tells us in uh, Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25, I'm reading there from verse 1. Matthew chapter 25, reading from verse 1. We have a responsibility. We have things to do that the Lord himself has uh, given us in the word of God. It says from verse 1, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be, uh, be likened unto, unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth and meet, uh, to meet the bridegroom. Then he tells us in verse 2, and five of them were wise and five were foolish. I'm sure you know the story. You know the parable. Uh, Jesus said these were all, they all were virgins, like members of the church, or everybody there, but some were wise and the others were foolish. And the reason why it says some were wise is that they had oil and they had the extra. Some people say, you know, this holy, holy kind of thing, that you can even be too much holy. I think it's better to be too much holy than to be less holy, and then you are not raptured. It's better to be more. It's better to be more strict. It's better to know that this is the way. And then you live a life of righteousness, of purity, in your business, in your transaction, in everything that you do. It's better that you are cheated. It's better that you say, I think I've gone too far. It's better to go too far than not to go far enough and become one of the foolish virgins. And then the Lord comes and the wise people are taken 
And then the foolish ones, the people that don't want to be too holy, too righteous, and too pure. They don't want to be too meticulous about this. They don't want to be too narrow-minded so that, you know, they will not uh, be looked at the world and see if you, where you're coming from. I think it's better to go too far than not to go far enough. And I pray that God will give us wisdom in Jesus' name. Yeah. It says then eventually when the bridegroom came, the wise one went in, but the foolish were not able to go. And what's the result of, you know, all the labor, all the service, all the preaching, all the singing, all the praying, all the, you know, warfare, spiritual warfare, all the evangelism, if on the final day, when the time comes for us to be able to go in, we're not able to go in. What's the use of all the convention, all the conferences, when we're not able to measure up? And if you make just a little, and then had I known that little I would have done, I pray that at this time, when we can make correction, the Lord will give us the wisdom and also the backbone and the courage to make that correction in Jesus' name. Amen. I come to point number three, final expectations of the master. The final expectations of the master. There's something the master expects of everyone that is called a disciple, a child of God, a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're looking at uh, Mark chapter 13. Mark chapter 13, I read from verse 35 there. Mark chapter 13, and I read from verse 35. Mark 13, verse 35. Here it says in verse 35, Watch ye therefore, for ye know not when the master of the house cometh. Watch ye therefore, watch ye therefore. Haven't many people forgotten that they ought to watch and that we just live our lives? We live from Monday to Saturday to Sunday, just, just anyhow. And there's nothing, there's no carefulness, there's no watchfulness, and there's uh, no sobriety. We just, we just live the life we live, and we, the life we live now is like uh, just, just natural, without prayer, without self denial, and without uh, self discipline to know I cannot go that way, I cannot have that thing that way, I cannot do that, uh, that thing in any way. And I cannot make that kind of relationship with that individual because I'm watching. You're watching over something. And here it says in verse, in verse 13, watch ye therefore. For ye know not when the, when the master of the house cometh at evening or at noon or at, at mid, midnight or in the, at the cock crowing or in the morning. And then it says, let's come in. Suddenly he find you sleeping. That is sleeping spiritually. And it says, what I say unto you, I say unto all. What's the word? Watch unto all. It says that that's the expectation that he has when he comes again. He wants us to watch. And I pray that we'll be watching in Jesus' name. Amen. And that takes an effort. That takes a, de a deliberate effort. That, you know, you're being careless. You're being just living your life, a regular life, a normal life. But you want to watch now. You want to make sure that everything you do, what if Jesus will come today? And what if the Lord will say, even if it's not coming today, that your time is over. Stop right now. What's the last thing is going to meet with you that you're doing? That's the reason you're saying watch so that when he comes, then you'll not be ashamed at his coming. In Luke chapter 13, Luke chapter 13, I'm reading from verse 23. Luke chapter 13, verse 23, then said one unto him, Lord, are there few that will be saved? Are there few that will be saved? And he answered them, strive to enter in. At the straight gate, for many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. Many will seek to enter in, but then they will not be able. And that means then the Lord was not going to lower the standard to make it easy for everybody uh, to get in. The standard remains the same. Before we were born, the Bible had been written. Before we were born, Christ came. And he gave us a standard of getting to heaven. Is God going to change the Bible because of me? Who am I? Because of you? Who are you? Who are we? That the Lord will change a standard. Is what? Because of you. We might seem significant to the few friends and few neighbors that know us. But that significance doesn't count with God. What counts with God is the people that understand that God is God. And God is up there exalted. And it's not going to come down or condescend because of you, because of me. That's why Jesus said, strive, endeavor, and discipline yourself. Do everything that it takes to enter into the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. Verse 25, when once the master of the house is risen up 
and has shut to the door. And ye begin to stand without and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us, and he shall answer and say unto you, I know you not, whence ye are, then shall ye begin to say, we have eaten and drunk in your presence, and thou hast taught in our streets. Which means that just listening to the word is not enough. That we came to the uh, convention is not enough. You taught in our streets. We ate in your presence. And the Lord said, that's not enough. Then shall ye begin to say, we have eaten, we have drunk in your presence. And thou hast taught in our streets. But he shall say, I tell you, I know you know from whence ye are. Depart from me, all ye that, all ye what? Tell me out loud. Workers of iniquity, the change had not taken place. They ate in his presence, they attended convention, they attended conferences, they were there with the other people, but there was no conversion, there was no change. That's why he said over there, I never knew you, you are workers of iniquity. They shall, they shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth when ye shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and you yourselves thrust out. I pray that that will not happen to us in Jesus' name. That is the same why then the Lord is saying, you have a responsibility, you have a part to play. Christ has done his own, has, uh, done his own part and God has done his own part. But now we who are following after the Lord, we in the church, we have our part to play. It tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. I read there from verse 19. 2 Timothy chapter 2. We're reading from verse 19. In verse 19, it says, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. That foundation is still there. Nothing has eroded it, nothing has cancelled it, and nothing has destroyed it. The foundation of God standeth sure. It says, Having their seal, it's even sealed. And it says, The Lord knoweth them that are his, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ do what? Apart from iniquity, everyone that nameth the name of Christ. And who names the name of Christ more than the preacher, more than the prayer warriors, more than the singers? We name the name of Christ every time. And it says if we name the name of Christ, depart from iniquity. Who names the name of Christ more than the members of the church? The members of the church that name the name of Christ, it says there's one thing we ought to do. We depart from iniquity. And then it, it goes on in verse 20. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. And then it says, if a man therefore do what? Purge himself. When we hear the word of God, it's not enough to say, well, I've heard, I'll think about it. It says, if a man therefore purge himself, it's not the pastor that will purge you, and it's not your a general superintendent that will purge you, or your overseer that will purge you. If a man therefore purge himself, if you know you want to get to heaven, if you know that you came to the church, not just to do religion, and not just to be over some people, you know, when we say over some people, that is like a pastor, like me now, for example, and they refer to me as general superintendent. If that is not, you know, my whole goal of being in deeper life, because uh, I'm coming to this uh, passage. Let me show you an important passage that I always read. This one is, uh, you know, is, uh, I don't have a monopoly on this, but I always read this one. It's in Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter 8, and it's in verse 9. Ecclesiastes chapter 8 is in verse 9. I'm waiting for you to open the Bible. It's very important. Underline it in your Bible. Ecclesiastes chapter 8. And we're looking at verse 9. If a man therefore purge himself, think about yourself. Think about your future. Think about your eternity. And think about your getting into heaven. And don't just think about I'm a leader, I'm a ruler, I'm a guide, and all that. And some of us in the congregation, you're too much concerned about the church about the church. You are not concerned about yourself. You are concerned about the pastor, about the church, about the choir, about this, about that. And that thing has got into our head. You know, leadership. And then you want to control this and control that. You can do that to hurt yourself for all eternity. Ecclesiastes chapter 8. Are you there? Yes. Verse 9. Are you there? Yes. Look at it. It says, all this have I, have I seen and applied my heart unto every work that is done under the sun. This is what I'm going to. There is a time 
wherein one man rules over another to his own hurt. There is a time when one man rules over another to his own hurt. If you carry leadership too far, if you carry control too far, you come to the church, you get nothing. You're sitting in the congregation, and all you want to do is to control the preacher and control uh, the prayer and control this and control that. And the only thing you come to church to do is to rule and to control. That, you know, if the preacher does not, uh, you know, submit to you and bend and bow to you, then the preacher is not going to find it easy. And then you get into a position that you are no more hearing the word of God. You are no more like a member of the church. You are just there to control things. And you can do that to your heart and go to hell. You can perish because of that. And it says, leave all the other people. Think about yourself. You came into this world alone. And you came to the church all alone. And you came so that you'll get to heaven. Rather than, you know, you just want to be in charge. And I say that to the ushers. I say that to, you know, the workers. You know, sometimes uh, you, you forget that you also need to benefit from the word of God. All you want to do now is just to control this or that. Of course, you know that if the preachers are, you know, if they know who they are, they preach the word of God and they, you know, abandon all that kind of control. But it is you that is going to lose. And the same thing, those of us who are even preachers, uh, you know, sometimes we try to rule the church and control the church until we lose our own soul. You know, we get angry like Moses. Wanting to control the children of Israel. Must I bring you water out of this rock? And then we strike it two times and God said, all right, you've uh, done ministry, but that land of Canaan, you'll not go there. Who wants to help other people and hurt himself? Who wants to get people by force to heaven? You can't get people to heaven by force. You preach the word. If they take it, wonderful. If they don't take it, that's between them and God. Rather than doing this to hurt yourself. That's why it says there is a time wherein one man rules over another to the point that he hurts himself. Just think about yourself. And the point is, you want to get to heaven. Am I right? What is important is heaven. That's what is important for you. Whether you are singing, you are praying, you are ushering, you are doing what, you are pastoring, you are ministering. Remember, do that as God gives you a chance, but don't do it to the point you miss heaven. I pray you'll not miss heaven in Jesus' name. That's why it says, if any man therefore purge himself from this, it shall be a vessel unto honor, then it says, sanctified, purified, made holy and righteous, meet, ready, suitable for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. I pray that that eternity, you'll not miss it in Jesus' name. The Lord can come any time from now. Apart from those who are certain days, we know that he can come any time from now. That's why you want to say, oh Lord, whatever it is you need to kind of cut off from my life, my private life, my public life, my you know, whatever life it is, I just want to get ready for that day. And God, the Lord, will get us ready in Jesus' name. We're going to rise up. We're going to pray. We're going to pray as unto the Lord. You're not praying because of me. You're not praying because of anybody. You're not praying to control the service or to control when we finish or when we start and all that, don't control things to your own hurt and to your own damage and to your own destruction. Just think about yourself, you and the Lord alone, you and the Lord alone, and say, oh Lord, I just want to get to that place. The Lord said, in my father's house are many mansions, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again so that I will receive you unto myself. That should be on your heart, that should be the things you are passionate about. Don't worry about, uh, you know, they corrected me this way, they corrected me that way, I'm not happy about this, I'm not happy about that. Let a righteous man smite me, it shall be ointment upon my head. The reason why we came here is so that we can get ready and prepare for heaven. And you ought to get ready and prepare for that heaven. The essentials of the gospel, the foundational experiences we ought to have. Have you truly repented? Have you given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ? Is there a change, a transformation in your life? And do you know for sure that if Jesus came today, your life is transparent enough and holy enough and righteous enough, and you'll be able to make it on that final day? Or is it just churchianity, control, ruling, ministry? Are you becoming corrigible? Untouchable? The watch doesn't have any impact anymore?
pray and tell the Lord. I told you that from the first day, we didn't come to entertain anybody here. We came to show you the way to heaven. You don't want to miss that heaven. Except you be converted and become as little children. You shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven. And except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Are you born again? Do you have the evidence of the new birth? If we're sinning in secret. That's not being born again. We're covering up our sins. That's not being born again. If we're wise to silence people. We're trying to gather some momentum or courage to speak to us. But we have the craftiness we call wisdom to silence them. That's not being born again. If we indulge in our sins, and we love our sins more than we love God. Cherished idol. That's not being born again. We're trying to keep the truth away from people. Under the pretext of they want to understand uh, the GS intonation. That's not sincerity. That's not being transparent. And that's not being submissive to your leader either. There is a heaven to gain. There is a hell to shun, to escape. Don't allow church activity to take the place of preparing and getting ready for heaven. Don't allow the desire, the drive to control, to rule the church. To take the place of being ready for heaven yourself. You are going to preach, preach the word. In season, out of season. Rebuke and reprove. Without long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. And they heed to themselves, teachers, having itching ears should do the work of an evangelist. And your hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ and make full proof of your ministry. Don't destroy the gospel. 
Don't pollute the gospel. You are struggling about something. Don't allow your private, personal struggles to affect the lives of other people. Call upon the name of the Lord. Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. That's still in the word of God. Don't cover up anything. And whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. For the seed of God remains, abides in him. He will not sin, he cannot sin. He has no interest in sinning. Is that a truly converted? Old things pass away. All things become new. Have that experience. Live in that experience. A minister to encourage people to have that experience and remain in that experience. that you will not be dull of hearing. And don't favor anybody at the expense of your spiritual life. At the expense of your eternal life. Don't defend anybody. The expense of losing the eternal reality of your relationship with the Lord. And don't be so soft and easy on yourself that you allow your flesh to ruin your soul. Think of eternity. The soul that sinneth it shall die. But whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The church is not a toy. Jesus died for the church that he might sanctify the church and present the church unto himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such sort of thing but that it should be holy and without blemish the church is not a toy Don't play games with the church. The church is more precious than that. We're dealing with the souls of men and women. Consider your ways.
Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Just leave them a little, about 10 minutes and then pray. 